everybody understands what laminar flow is and we are able to explain nicely to most people. Turbulence also, I think all of us will be able to give nice uh, explanation, well mixed flow, so on and so forth. But from a point of view of fluid mechanics and heat transfer, it is important to understand the contribution of turbulence to increasing the heat transfer coefficient, why it happens, how it happens is what we are trying to look for from a mathematical point of view. Okay. So, <clears throat> with this idea, let us just go and take a few things. First of all, in our everyday uh, life, okay, we have various situations where turbulence is there. Okay. Normally, if you open the tap very slowly, very, very small opening for flow, if you give, the flow will come out in a very nice manner and that is a good example of laminar flow. Now, if the same tap, same water, you just open the tap fully, you are going to see lot of chaos in the flow from uh, inlet to the uh, bucket. Okay. So, turbulent flow basically is there in most uh, daily situations. Okay. So, your washing machine where there is mixing. So, all these things we, uh, we observe in everyday life. Now, we just want to mathematically quantify turbulence and try to understand how to use these things to understand heat transfer. Okay. So, just a couple of uh, introductory slides. To transfer required heat between solid and a fluid, uh, such as in coils of air conditioner, etcetera, we would require enormously large heat exchanger if the flow were laminar. We will understand this the moment we understand how to calculate the heat transfer coefficient or Nusselt number. Okay. So, take this as a statement for now. Turbulence is important in mixing of fluid. Smoke from a stack would continue for miles as a ribbon of pollutant without rapid dispersion within the surrounding air if the flow were laminar. Okay. And if you see exhaust of an automobile or why go that far? In a simple example, if you take your incense stick, uh, agarbatti, you light the incense stick and you just leave it in the room. If the air is still, there is no motion absolutely, then you would expect the smoke to rise almost like the incense stick, straight line. But because of mixing turbulence etcetera, you see this diffusion, you see the smoke getting completely mixed or after a certain distance into the uh, atmosphere. So, the, that is an example of turbulence. And of course, there are situations where you would need laminar flow, there are situations where you would definitely want turbulent flow. Pressure drop in pipes is greatly enhanced or becomes more in case of turbulent flow situation. So, pumping power becomes very high, it is low when the flow is laminar. Blood flow through an artery is normally laminar except in large arteries, where high blood flow rates is there, probably the aorta. And aerodynamic drag on an airplane wing can be considerably small when laminar flow is flowing is there rather than turbulent. So, when we give examples, these are typical things that we keep telling, you know, when, when you have to talk to somebody about turbulence, these are things that we will normally say. Now, what is turbulence? Is there a definition? So, this is from Taylor and Von Karman. Turbulence is an irregular motion, which in general makes its appearance in fluids, gases or liquid, when they flow past a solid surface or even when neighboring streams of the same fluid flow past one another. Okay, I am just reading, we will, we will understand it uh, from uh, English point of view first and then physical point of view. Turbulent fluid motion is an irregular condition of flow in which various quantities show random variation with time and space coordinates. So, statistically a distinct average value has to be discerned, okay, a lot of blah blah. Now, forget fluid mechanics, let us just go to normal your road. Most of us we see you know in on television or when, when there is a scene in a movie where you would they show the traffic in a foreign country. Okay, traffic in a foreign country, you see 
whichever time of the day it is, though it might be crowded, but it will have a nice ordered uh, flow. That means, there would be lanes drawn, white lines would be there and vehicles would be going exactly in that lane without randomly crisscrossing. Yeah, one or two uh, bad apples will be there who will just want to cut through the traffic, but by and large if you see, you will have one row for buses where only buses would go, then the slow moving traffic, then slightly faster moving and the fastest moving traffic. So, when you have a very nice orderly flow, at any given instant of time, I can quantify various quantities very easily. So, if I want to locate, if you are, if in your, in your room, if you have a bookshelf and books are arranged in the alphabetical order of the authors, very easily you can spot a book and take it out. So, it is a very nice arrangement. Whereas, if you know all types of books, you know uh, uh, engineering, uh, novels, all these things are mixed together and stacked in your library, in your college library. If there is no order, then to find a single book is going to be very difficult. So, turbulence essentially says, if now in our cities, you see traffic, any time of the uh, day or night, in any city, any road, even the smallest of the road, you would have all kinds of vehicular motion in all possible directions. Suddenly, somebody will come from some side, somebody will want to turn right from the leftmost lane, all these things what is going to cause? It is going to cause an obstruction or if everybody is going at the same speed, then it is okay. But if this fellow from the left wants to turn to the right, the person coming here has to stop, so, so that he lets the other fellow go. So, what we are saying is, this kind of chaotic, ir irregular, unpredictable, let us put it that way, unpredictable motion, which is there in all fluid flow situations, whether it is a gas or a liquid, when a fluid flow passes over a solid surface, that is flow over a solid surface, so air foil or aeroplane wing or when the fluid streams mix amongst themselves, okay, like water example, like water when they are mixing amongst themselves, that is called as turbulence. Okay. And it is an irregular, random, it cannot be quantified mathematically at all. It can be quantified mathematically for every given instant of time, hopefully, but in general I cannot say that, you know, if, if I am going to have in, in, in your uh, hospital, in, you will see various devices where you have this kind of uh, uh, things going up and down, some meters which show some fluctuations. So, turbulence essentially will have all quantities of interest, velocity, pressure, temperature, all these things would very randomly with space and time. Okay. So, mathematically any quantity that we take, mathematically if we take any quantity, let us take pressure or, or y pressure, velocity, u is x, y, z and t. Okay. All these four variables, dependent vari independent variables would be there. So, for me to quantify a velocity at a given instant, it is not very easy. Whereas, if I am if I am on a road like this and two lanes are there, if this is car A which is going in this direction, no matter what wherever I am, I can spot the car A because it is be behind another car B and another car C is following it. It is a well ordered uh, flow. Whereas, if this one is going all around the place, at any given instant of time, there is high probability that it could be here or here or anywhere else. Same thing here, our velocity is going to be three dimensional, it is going to be a function of space and time and each quantity, for example, velocity u, v, w, pressure, any quantity will have a different value at different instances of time. So, now we are measuring something, next instant, one second later, half a second later, it would have a different value, values of all the components would also be different. Okay. So, so much for the introduction and this figure, this axis could be anything, any dependent variable. Here we have shown u, it could be v, w, temperature, pressure, anything. This is a typical representation of any quantity which is affected by turbulence. What we are saying, let us take the example of velocity, 
velocity fluctuation with respect to time. So, if I have a sensor which is going to measure like pressure uh, gauge or whatever any sensor which is going to measure that quantity with respect to time, you will get any sort of such random fluctuation. Okay. Now, nowadays this, this concept is applied everywhere. You go to any television channel, one channel will have this business news where the sensex would be shown up and down, up and down, up and down for every instant of time. This company's stock went like this, that went like this, so on and so forth. So, you will see such kind of graphs even in, on television for stock exchanges also. What essentially we are saying is, at every instant as if it is very important, if you want to uh, track that component stock of a particular company, in our case velocity, pressure, if I make a plot with respect to time, it is going to generally, unless there is a serious problem, you know, uh, in a particular company there is a serious problem or, you know, unforeseen circumstances not being there, good or bad, it is going to generally fluctuate about a mean quantity. That is what we are trying to say. All being well, all being normal, your body temperature all being normal is going to be roughly around 98.4 Fahrenheit, all being normal. So, on a normal day, it might go up or down a little bit, which you probably do not even discern uh, like this. But when you have a fever, of course, you will have to track it very carefully. Same thing what we are saying, everything being normal in a turbulent flow, you would have a very random nature of fluctuation about some kind of a mean quantity. So, this mean quantity is shown by a black line in this diagram. We will just represent it. Mean quantity, mean value and if this axis is time and let us take u only which they have taken. So, this is u bar, any mean quantity, any quantity of interest, whether it is u, v, w, pressure, temperature, any of these things can be written as a sum of a mean quantity and a fluctuating component at that instant of time. So, for example, gold price, on a given day it is uh, whatever, I do not know the rate, 20,000 rupees per 10 grams, whatever it may be. If you are going to track the price of gold every instant of time, uh, after every 5 minutes, let us say and make a plot, it would be 20,005, 19,950, so on and so forth. So, the fluctuation that we have over and above this mean quantity, that if I say is a local, very, very local thing. So, this is the fluctuation, how much it deviates from the mean that is the fluctuation. So, this fluctuation is given by the primes, this is we call this u prime, this is called mean quantity is called mean value. Summation of mean and fluctuating quantity is the general definition for any uh, dependent variable u, v, w, p or t. So, if I plot this, I will get some graph which goes something like this, something like this, I do not know. This, if I say at any instant, I am always going to have this mean component and a fluctuating component. Okay. So, what is the usefulness of this? I have all this information, what is it going to help me do? It helps me do something from statistics point of view. We can say, <coughs> by and large, if I take average of this, what is going to happen? The average is going to be something, it is again going to be some value, which is around the mean value, it is not going to be somewhere here. So, that is clear. As long as the fluctuations are around the mean value, we do not expect any surprises in the uh, average quantity. So, what we are saying is this, we have to introduce this concept of time, T naught let us say is our first reading and T naught plus capital T is our next reading. Okay. So, uh, what I am going to know, do, do now is called as a time average. By time average, I mean I take 
data over a sufficiently long period of time. How long is this long period of time? This long period of time is chosen, so that it encompasses all the a lot of fluctuations. I should not be taking capital T to be of the order of magnitude of this, okay, roughly this much. That is not acceptable. Over a sufficiently, that is when you go to hospital, they say we will observe the patient for two days. What are they going to do? Connect several things and keep and see that there is no abnormal behavior over the next two days. Then they say, oh, he is fit to go home. So, this time period over which the observations are made, that becomes important. Okay. So, this time period is sufficiently larger than the time for individual fluctuations. So, we are what we are going to do is what we call as time averaging. But how do we get this mean quantity? I wrote here on the whiteboard, I wrote there is a mean component and a fluctuating component of velocity. Similarly, there is a mean component v plus v prime, w bar plus w prime, p bar plus p prime, t bar plus t prime. Very nice. So, what? Who gives me all these quantities? These quantities, the barred ones, mean quantities, I get measurements at every instant of time, t and the value. 1, 2, 3, 4, several measurements I will get and I will get these quantities. Okay. So, time averaging basically does the following. U bar mean uh, mean quantity value is actual value integrated with time between the limits t naught when you start the measurement till the time you end the measurement t naught plus t and obviously for a time average you will divide this by the time period of interest so what we have done is essentially integration is summation so i take all the values price of gold if you say it is going to be whatever is the amount 20,005, 20,010, 19,950 all these things you keep adding divided by time. Gold of course, time is not this one, but in velocity etcetera you are going to take the time aspect. So, at, at 315 this is the velocity, 316 next is the velocity so on and so forth and you get the time average quantity. So, time average quantity u bar is what we get, u is what we know. Therefore, I can get what I call as the fluctuating component u is equal to u bar plus u prime. u bar plus u prime will tell me this is measured, this is computed. Therefore, I will be able to get u prime is equal to u minus u bar. Okay u minus u bar I am going to get. What is the use of this? Similarly, if I put this, why is this useful? We will see in a minute. So, u, if I take average, time average of these fluctuations, okay, on a given day, your body temperature, we say, yeah, I, I am doing fine, it is 98.4. Momentarily, if you keep measuring, it would have gone up or down by 0 0.1 or 0 0.2 degrees. But on an average, when everything is normal, your you say the summation or average of these fluctuations is going to be equal to 0. So, that is what we are saying here. The next thing, time average of the fluctuating quantity u prime, when I, when I do this, when I did what I did here, at time t 1, I had a u time t 2 I had another u, time t 3 I had another u, so on and so forth. For all this, I could get 1 u bar. Therefore, after computing this, I will get 1 u prime, u 1 prime, u 2 prime, which is obtained from this relationship, u 3 prime, so on and so forth. So, this is the fluctuating component at each instant of time. Now, what I am saying? is if I do a time average of this fluctuating component, that mathematically I will put this as u minus u bar d t 1 over capital T going from t naught to t naught plus t. So, 
if I do that, this I am splitting this u d t minus u bar d t okay, and separating these two, what do I get? u bar prime essentially this first, this u bar is a constant. So, u bar can be pulled out of the integral sign. So, integral of d t is nothing but time t applying the limits, I will get capital T, I will get u bar t here, the second term. First term is u d t integrated, u d t integrated essentially gives me t times u bar. How did I do that? u d t integrated is this one from the first part, this is the definition. So, this is t u bar and this is u bar t, which is going to cancel to give me 0. So, time time average of any fluctuating quantity is equal to 0. That means, u bar prime, prime is for fluctuating quantity, bar is for the average. It is bar represents average, prime represents fluctuation or fluctuating quantity. So, time average of any fluctuating quantity is equal to 0. Okay, very good. So, that is that was quite easy for us to understand also, because we are saying that these two quantities are, if I sum up the randomness is such that by and large it is going to add the positive side fluctuations summation would be equal to the negative sign, uh, side fluctuation summation and it is going to add up to 0, that is easy. Now, what we are saying is you will come across terms where you have square of the fluctuating quantity, where you will see that once we uh, go back and put this in the navier stokes equation, we will see u d u by d x, those kind of terms, product terms where they are, you will see the product of the fluctuating quantity. Obviously, if we look at two points. Let us say this one, fluctuation is say plus 0.1, fluctuation here is say minus 0.1. Square of that is definitely a positive quantity. So, summation of these things or a time average of the square of a fluctuating quantity is therefore, definitely not equal to 0. This is something which we have to keep in mind. Fluctuating quantity has been squared time average of that is definitely not equal to 0. Time average of the fluctuating quantity is 0, but time average of the square of the fluctuating quantity is not equal to 0. This is very important, because this quantity contributes to the fluctuating part of the kinetic energy term etcetera. You see u bar square, that, that will be definitely having a u prime square etcetera. So, this time average is defined as 1 over capital T u, bar, u prime squared integrated over dt from t naught to t naught plus capital T. Okay. Then turbulence intensity or intensity of turbulence is given by this, how much, how far from the mean is this going. You know, if somebody is going, if you are when you take measurement, you know doctor says every one hour take the fever and let me know. So, if there are sudden jumps, it is a cause of alarm. Same thing here, the fluctuations, intensity of fluctuation is going to be a measure of the turbulence. So, higher the intensity, I know that it is more turbulent. This is intuition, nobody has taught me this. Higher the intensity means, greater is the number associated with the fluctuation you know it is going to be more turbulent. So, this intensity, turbulence intensity is given by this. Okay. Fluctuating quantity time average value, square of the fluctuating quantity time average, that will give you a positive number, square root of that okay, divided by the mean value of the velocity, that is what is we call as a turbulence intensity. Okay. Now, things that we, we are going to come across very frequently in turbulence that we will take up quickly. We will definitely almost always come up with this need to use this term, 
u square. So, we will see this in the Navier Stokes equation first term itself. This is u bar plus u prime the whole square, and you can write with me, it is there in your slides anyway. This is u bar square plus 2 u bar u prime plus u prime square. So, I have just expanded the bracket. Now, if I take time average of this, that means what? I am going to integrate this from t naught to t naught plus capital T over a finite time period, integrate both left hand side and right hand side. So, if I do that, the left hand side becomes u squared bar, this is equal to, let us take this term, u bar squared time average of a constant which has been squared is the same thing. So, you are not going to get anything new from that. So, it is u bar squared bar I will write. Second quantity is this one 2 u bar u prime whole bar plus u prime squared bar which is the third quantity. Okay. So, what does this tell me? which of these terms on the right hand side are going to go to 0. So, we have, let me put this properly, it is given here already, this quantity u bar u prime, okay, because of the fact that, I, this is given here, I do not want to write this, because of the fact that u bar u prime is nothing but 1 over t, this definition of time averaging I am using. I am going to expand this u bar u prime when you are integrating, u bar is a constant, it comes out. So, you are integrating u prime d t essentially and integral of the fluctuating quantity we saw in the previous slide was equal to 0. Okay. So, therefore, this second, uh, this term 2 u bar u prime, time average of that quantity will be equal to 0. Therefore, I am left with u squared bar is equal to u prime squared bar plus u bar squared with a bar. I can take that out because time average of a constant quantity does not matter. So, it is just u bar times u bar. Okay. So, this definitions we will use very frequently. I will just complete one more thing and then we will stop. We will also need to have product of two different quantities that is u times v that time average of that that is u bar plus u prime times v bar plus v prime. You will expand that you will get four terms u bar v bar u prime v bar v prime u bar plus u prime v prime. When I take time average of that, that is left hand side and right hand side, I do this summation integration business. This one is the time averaging thing. If I do this on the left hand side and right hand side, I would get by similar logic as I had in this slide. This term went off to 0. Same thing will happen. This one and this one bar and a prime product will go to 0. I will get u v bar time average of the product of two different quantities is u bar v bar product of the mean quantity plus product of the fluctuation time average. Remember u prime squared bar was not equal to 0, product of two fluctuations is also definitely not equal to 0, time averaging of that is also not equal to 0. There is no reason why it should be equal to 0. By chance, if it comes out to be 0 in a given situation, okay, so be it. But in general, we cannot say that product of fluctuations of two different quantities equal to 0. That is not possible. So, these are the general rules. Time average of a mean quantity is nothing but the mean quantity. If I have two quantities which are added and there is a time average, it is going to be the average of each of them, product 
essentially the same thing and integral and differential also the same thing. So, next class that is on Monday, what we will do is quickly we will we will write the turbulent form of the Navier-Stokes equation, which means we will substitute where let us say we will this is the continuity equation, we will substitute u is equal to u bar plus u prime, v equal to v bar plus v prime, w equal to w bar plus w prime, expand the brackets and we will say that when I do the time averaging of these equations, I will lose out certain terms and then I would get the turbulent form of representation of the continuity equation. I will write the turbulent representation of the Navier-Stokes equation and this is the turbulent representation of the Navier-Stokes equation and similarly, we will do for all the three equations of the momentum equation. Okay. Then we will go to the energy equation. Okay. Mufakkam Ja College, Hyderabad, any questions please? Can we make use of the transformation equation for a rotating cylinder? No. For two dimensional, two dimensional product solution equation, if not, how to calculate or how to see the temperature distribution in a rotating cylinder for two dimensional? The question asked by one of the participants is that, in a rotating cylinder, can I use multi-dimensional approach for transient conduction problems? <coughs> in a rotating cylinder, let us take the rotating cylinder problem. What is there in a rotating cylinder problem? See, in conduction problem, one of the major assumptions is that my body is stationary. That is the major assumptions. That is the condition, not just the assumption. That is the condition for which my conduction problems can be solved. Now, if it starts rotating, what is that which comes into picture? The heat transfer coefficient in a rotating cylinder from one location to another location is going to change. That is, now I am going to have an additional body force because of rotation. So, I can answer number one is that directly the solutions which we have derived for transient conduction are just not applicable, number one. Number two, I have to set up the equations for rotating cylinder that I can set up only after my convection. That is, I have to take both the, with the rotation, I have to take with all velocity profiles, I have to solve for velocity profile, get the heat transfer coefficient and then solve. No. If you say that no, I do not want to use velocity profiles, I somehow want to make a shortcut and solve this problem, okay. In that case, for a rotating cylinder, from location to location, what is the local heat transfer coefficient, if it is available in the literature that heat transfer coefficient has to be taken and solved. Then there is no closed form solution. I have to take the recourse of numerical methods. So, that is the answer for this question ma'am. Yeah. Upon considering the combined effects of hydrodynamic boundary layer and thermal boundary layer for a flat field, uh, for a flat plate, for a flow over the flat plate, what will be the effect of each phenomena over the another? Okay. The question asked is by one of the participants, if we take flow over a flat plate, mm. we have velocity boundary layer and bound, high, thermal boundary layer, what is the interaction between these two boundary layers? I think we will have to postpone this question for some time because it depends on the Prandtl number. Of course, very cursorily professor has touched and went in the morning, but we will, we will answer this question in great detail after we derive energy equation on Monday's lecture. So, I am sorry, I will have to postpone this question, but cursorily if I have to answer, it is dependent again on Reynolds and Prandtl number. Okay, Professor? Thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you. SGS, ITS, Indoor, you have any questions please? Is it possible that the viscosity can vary in the uh, different directions? Is it possible for a fluid? Okay. I, at least I have not, the question asked by one of the participants is that viscosity, can viscosity vary in various directions? This is a very good question. Why? Because I do not know the answer. The viscosity to the best of my knowledge, I, I have not come across viscosity variation in direction. I have come across only thermal conductivity. So, I, I cannot say that it cannot vary with direction. We will look into it. But to the best of my knowledge, at least I have not come across viscosity variation in the direction because why I say this because 
for a fluid which is flowing how I cannot imagine how the viscosity can vary with the direction. So, but anyway I will do the homework and come back to you thanks for your good question. Yeah, another thing another way of looking at it is let us say I have flow over a flat plate and in the flat plate there is temperature varying in various locations. Then viscosity is varying in various locations because by the virtue of the flat plate temperature varying in at different locations. That way we can perhaps imagine the viscosity variation with the direction actually it is not with direction it is with temperature, but it so happens that it manifests in terms of direction, direction by virtue of temperature. Okay. Is that okay professor? Amal Jyoti College, Kerala, any questions? Sir, you are given the rotational equation as uh, Wx is equal to half of uh, dou V by dou X plus dou V by dou X minus uh, dou U by dou Y. Yeah. So, in that equation, uh, uh, sir, uh, can we actually say it as a rotation or an angular deformation equation? Because it is basically uh, we are deriving the equation on the basis of the angular deformation. Now, uh, is that terms very different rotation or can we use specifically as rotation? Can yeah, you use it as only angular yeah, deformation? Yeah, yeah. See, the question asked by one of the participants is that can I use the uh, rotation and angular deformation replacingly? Very good question, very good question. I would say why very good question because there is a subtle difference which I forgot to mention. You have brought it out very nicely. See, the rotation, what am I saying? If I tell if this is what is happening. This is the fluid element which was there O A B C. Now, what has happened to O A? It has got rotated to O A prime and O B has got rotated to O B prime. So, this is the rotation, this is the rotation because of the velocity gradient. Rotation if I have to tell that is omega O A and omega O B, but the same thing I express for shearing strain, but for shearing strain what have I done? For shearing strain I have taken that delta alpha plus delta beta that is the total deformation what my fluid particle has undergone. But in terms of rotation, in terms of rotation of course, here just for the sake of uh, being uh, what to say explain both the things in one shot it is shown, but usually rotation means we mean the rotation of a fluid particle means it will be this in this form in this form. So, it is just that ease for presentation we have presented it that way, but most of the times rotation is going to be in one direction both the fluid that is both O A and O B would have rotated in the same direction, but not equally that is delta alpha need not be equal to delta beta. However, rotation means both are in the same direction this is just that we have represented it that way. So, I think that would answer your question. Yeah, is that okay? See, between do u by do y and do v. Now you see, now you see if it make any difference. See, positive or negative sign does it make a difference? What would be the sign for this? What would be the sign for this? This would be del v by del, sorry, del u by del x plus sorry, what is this? del v by del v by del y del v by del x plus del u by del y it would become in this case. So, there would not be negative sign. So, the negative and positive is depending on the clockwise or anti clockwise. So, there is no confusion on this score professor is that okay? Right. Thank you. Yes professor any questions? I would like to know about the book you have mentioned. Uh, is it available or it is out of print? Which book? Which book? I have given n number of books. of uh, fluid mechanics by Yuan. Yuan whether is. Whether it is available or out of print. Yuan, uh, can yeah. you just give me an idea where I will get that book? Yeah. Oh. Okay. One of the participants question uh, is, one of the participants. Foundations of fluid mechanics. You have just mentioned. Yeah. One of the participants question is fundamentals of fluid mechanics Yuan. Is it available? Yes. It is not available. It is very much out of print. It is not available, but if you go to InfiBeam 
or amazon.com used books you will get number one option number one or option number two I know you are from IIT Bombay if you come to IIT Bombay you will get that book in IIT Bombay library that book is there Nagpur VNIT Nagpur if that is mixed convection which is the combination of free convection and forced convection okay both participate and combine and they form the mixed convection so sir can you give any practical example how that mixed convection occurs yeah actually we are in fact this is the one of the participants question is there are no two more uh, two types of convection actually there are three types of convection that is forced convection natural convection and mixed convection mixed con convection is essentially a situation where in which both natural convection and forced convection are important or both are important or are equal order okay so in fact we are going to cover this in at the end of natural convection okay if you have to imagine there is a flat plate and there is a fan also and there are gradients also we are going to cover this mixed convection at the end of natural convection so we will have to wait till the end of natural convection professor okay thank you sir yeah. any other any other question from this center yes sir yes sir uh, sir, first question is, can we physically control this process of boundary layer formation that is velocity boundary layer and thermal boundary layer? Yeah, the question Do is... Do you have any control yeah. over this process? Yeah the, yeah, the question asked by one of the participants is that can anyone control physically the boundary layer, boundary layer velocity boundary layer for example. <laughs> so, I think it is possible. It is little early, but nevertheless you have asked the question, so I need to answer. So, let us say I have a flat plate, I have a flat plate and the boundary layer is being formed. So, now one way of controlling the boundary layer is, let us say I make holes in this plate. I make holes in this plate and either blow air or suck air. Then what is happening? I am playing with this boundary layer, I am just removing this boundary layer. So, boundary layer can be controlled either through suction or blowing. Either through suction or blowing, boundary layer can be controlled. Is that okay, Professor? Uh, sir, what about thermal boundary layer? That also same thing, thing, same, same thing. thing. If same I am thing. in thermal boundary layer, velocity boundary layer. Yeah. See, the question now asked is, velocity boundary layer is controlled, how about thermal boundary layer? Thermo if velocity boundary layer is controlled, thermal boundary layer also gets affected. Automatically. Automatically. Right? And what professor is saying is that, not only suction and blowing, I can put some enhancers. That is what we have been talking since so many days. Rib, what is that? Enhancers, uh, ribs or vertex generators or springs, various things, whatever we are putting. What is that we are trying to control? We are trying to control the boundary layer. Break only. the boundary layer. We are na? trying to break the laminar sublayer so that the complete boundary layer becomes turbulent. Essentially, what are we doing? We are controlling the boundary layer. Is that okay? Okay. City boundary layer and thermal boundary layer is loss or benefit from the point of view of losses associated with the fluid flow or heat transfer, rate of heat transfer. Okay. We will so ultimately why we are studying this concept, whether it is a loss or benefit from the point of view of heat transfer or losses. Okay. The question is that formation of hydrodynamic or thermal boundary layer, is it useful or is it causing some loss in terms of the heat transfer and the fluid mechanics aspect? So I would ask the question back to you, what is the bound cause for this boundary layer formation? It is viscosity, right? What is happening because of viscosity? What is uh, viscosity causes shear stress, okay? Because of stress, shear stress, what is going to happen? Yeah, so what is happening because of shear stress, you are going to have friction. Okay, shear stress is manifesting itself in terms of delta P. Okay, and that is not something which we like. But we, have to we have to overcome that, right? So it is, a, it is not wanted. 
Definitely, but, it is not wanted. But we would like to everywhere the flow to slip, but that's not possible. Viscous forces are there because of, of viscosity. So it is unwanted, but, but it is there. It we cannot to to be it. avoided. No, it, it cannot, cannot be, be avoided. avoided. So it is unwanted. No doubt about that. But we have to overcome and put and fix a pump. How to decide the size of the pump by overcoming this frictional <coughs> losses which are caused by viscosity is the question what we are trying to address. This is for friction, but similarly we can think of heat transfer coefficient also. Yeah, we are back as promised. Hello. Uh, yes, sir. Sir, uh, we have some uh, doubt regarding the role of conduction between the uh, first layer and the boundary layer. Uh, we know that the heat transfer from surface to the first layer is purely by conduction. Correct. But sir, can we always neglect uh, control of conduction between second layer and the boundary layer? Question by one of the participants is that, yes, we can understand it is the conduction in the first, first layer of the boundary layer, but the whether the conduction is there in subsequent layers as well. Conduction will always be there. See, I think there is a misconception here. Why cannot conduction occur even if the fluid is flowing? Why, why it cannot occur? It can still occur, right? But yes, how effective it would be? It is a different question. But even in a moving fluid, conduction can still be there. Why it cannot be there? In fact, that is what is the energy equation. You have convection part on the left hand side, right hand side is conduction on and all other parts. So, conduction is always there. What we are saying is in the on the first layer when the fluid is at zero velocity, that layer of fluid there is no convection, heat transfer is purely by conduction. That is what we are trying to say. It does not mean uh, that in the next layer convection is, conduction is not there, that conduction gets manifested in terms of this heat transfer coefficient because advection plus diffusion is what is convection. So, inherently when I say convection is there, it involves conduction, though we cannot bring out its effect separately like that. Okay. Is that okay? That is a good question. Huh? You really cooked a good question. Uh, but, sir, but sir, from design point of view, we always neglect that portion. But sir, from design point of view, we neglect the value uh, amount of heat transfer by conduction in that layer. No. The participant's question is, we neglect the conduction in the second and the subsequent layers. Where do, we di where do we differentiate first layer, second layer and third layer? Whatever we are telling as the heat transfer <coughs> coefficient is the net effect of this advection and diffusion over the complete thermal boundary layer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good, good question. Good question. question.